fantastic panel. Thank you. Uh, we have, <laughs> we have um, about a half an hour before we break for lunch. So I'm moderating the discussion. I will recognize someone to uh, make a contribution, but please make it short. Uh, no speeches right now. And uh, sharply frame your question. And if you have it for a particular panelist, please identify him or her. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm really fascinated by the economy of communion. My question is this, Catholic, the, the economic aspects of Catholic social teaching don't take place in a vacuum. Um, how, does, how, how does this model and the collaboration with businesses, um, how does it avoid the, um, the kind of Western ideological colonization that Francis warns so much about with regard to the rest of Catholic social teaching, especially with regard to the family? So I will just note that one of the interesting um, aspects of the economy of communion is that it is a global movement. And I think it's actually the ways that it's developed and the sort of kind of principles and economic framework that it's adopted is largely rooted in a Western context. And there is this kind of active, especially given some participation uh, in particular of uh, groups of entrepreneurs in Sub-Saharan Africa, there's been this active sort of conversation underway about exactly that, which is how do we ensure that we don't revert to some of what Paula was describing about the pathology of individualism <laughs> and remain rooted. So I, I would say that actually the economy of communion is sort of um, the embodiment of contradiction and that in some ways it embraces neoliberal Western economic tradition, but it privileges community and communion. So you engage in that act while in community. You can't do it in isolation. So everything that you're building for your company and the end goals of that company and its resources are actually put in common, they're put in communion, and so that in some ways, I think, ensures that we remain rooted in, in family. I hope that helps. Thank you, I echo Russ, this is a fantastic panel, but I'll, I'll give a short question, I'll avoid my temptation to be long. Um, how do we um, use these Catholic ecclesial movements to kind of break down some of the structures of sin, for want of a better word, that prevail in our global economy today. For example, we Catholics have a long tradition of worker cooperatives. We have Silicon Valley, which in my view is quite amenable to worker cooperatives, but they don't really interest it. How do we use these to build up the union movement we used to have worker priests. Strong unions was a part of the Catholic identity. How do we follow Pope Francis's call to build up the popular movements, a very strong Latin American thing where you have, you know, the, some of the poorest of the poor as active agents of their own development? Um, yeah, so basically that's my question. I'll take a first crack at this and invite others to, to weigh in. So. Um, I love that question in part because uh, as a student of economics myself, I found myself falling more and more in love with the, the, the history of the church as engaged in cooperative economics and business. Um, so one thing I'll say is just from a very practical standpoint, I do not think the economy of communion could have taken root and grown to what it is today without the structures and practices um, and value system of the Focolare movement. It has been essential in order to create that mutual, um, that sense of mutuality between those in need and the entrepreneurs that are building these companies. The Focolare community has to be in place and there have to be people who have, who live in intimate relationship with those that are encountering real significant material need. And so that, uh, the economy of communion actually reached a point about seven years ago where the profits that were being put in common by these enterprises fully met the needs of, uh, that were identified by everyone in the Focolare and they had to start reaching out more broadly to look at other ways to dedicate those resources. And it actually was really challenging because the, the governance system that was in place through Focolare had been serving it so well in terms of building those kinds of cooperative relationships. Um, 
what's interesting too is some of the early adopters of the economy of communion um, call to action, if you will, in Latin America were cooperatives themselves. Um, and so they continue to thrive and the community that I lived in in, in Lopiano, Italy, um, has started a, an economy of communion cooperative there. And what they have found is creating a space for those companies to exist, not in isolation, but literally occupying the same physical space has just heightened this call to action to live the gospel in their business lives. Um, but the economy of communion has been careful to not say, we're not all about cooperatives, right? Like you discern in freedom how it is that you feel like you're going to live this calling. But there's so much more to unpack with that question and I'm sure others have thoughts. Paulo, do you have see a note? One of the most striking things to me about every movement that I've looked at or, or, or come across, uh, in either in the abstract or m more in terms of people I've gotten to know, um, is how much all of them have begun and been propelled by the event of a personal encounter with Christ. They'd, none of them began as projects. None of them began as programs. They all generate action, but none of them are activists in the sense of that being the center of what they're about. Right? All of that leads me to, to think that, you know, it, that it, in large part, the answer to, to Tony's question is it, it's a question of conversion. It's a question of encountering Christ and bringing that to the world again. And, and, I, and I don't mean that, so it has to be personal, right? I don't mean that in a pietistic or a moralistic sense. But, but ultimately a recognition that, you know, as, as, as Luigi Giussani often used to say, the forces that change history and change the world are the same forces that change the human heart. And so that's where we have to begin, and I think the movements show the power of beginning there. Mm -hmm. Father Ansel. I appreciate very much the um, emphasis on communion and the concreteness of uh, human beings, their needs, empowering the poor, finding them labor. Um, now, this is Silicon Valley is close by. Artificial intelligence is big, and uh, I have sort of gotten into that topic more recently. And just listening to that, I'm feeling sort of a disconnect <laughs> because, so, especially in California, uh, I noticed. Uh, there's some one thing that environmentalists and artificial intelligence people share, namely human beings are the problem. And we would be better off without them. And, um, and I'm wondering where does that leave the poor and all these kind of concerns if labor is being taken over by machines and artificial intelligence. We could try to help them find labor, but there isn't any labor. So people actually talk rather about universal basic income and things like that. Nobody is, needs to work, we just give people money. <laughs> but that makes human beings in these communities sort of purposeless and uh, just passive recipients of um, uh, wealth that's generated technologically and uh, basically a universe that's run on that level. And um, what, where does, leave, does that leave all these kind of initiatives which are so good? Please, any of you would like to take it? Thank you for that question because it's on everybody's minds. <laughs> so um, a couple, couple of thoughts and then I, I actually think a lot of folks in this room could continue to build on this. So I think what you just articulated just heightens the urgency of a call to do what we've been discussing here, which is to think about the, the teaching of the church, right, which which really does emphasize the dignifying nature of work and a sense of purpose and ensure that that's at the center of our decision making. And I think we could look at that on a micro level in terms of how we build firms and what kinds of decisions we make about the work that we provide. We can look at it on a macro level from a policy perspective and think about the right regulatory environment and how does it, how is it born out of asking very Aristotelian questions around what is the good society, right? Which we need to be doing more of. And how do we make love a governing principle for society? Um, I would 
say that one thing I've been very encouraged by is the emergence of an economy of care and an economy of craft in the midst of increasing technological progress. So as we might look at the role that automation plays in displacing certain types of jobs and certain um, skill sets, there are also new types of jobs and skill sets that emerge alongside that, just like we've seen in every sort of massive revolution, right? And so if the economy of care and the economy of craft that are emerging, um, I, would, I would argue they're, they're more relational and that in fact, the need to build people who can live in relationship in communion with others is just growing. It's, and it's urgent. <laughs> And I think a lot of companies in Silicon Valley are actually grappling with the consequences of what they're building and the technocratic mind. I mean, we've, someone brought this up earlier, but there's a crisis underway. I was at Apple uh, recently where a group of technologists convened to talk about the question, what does it mean to be human? Because they recognize that a lot of the products and services that they're building have certainly in many ways amplified good collective action, but they've also amplified one's ability to air their grievances, to air their demons. Mm. So how we design for that matters, right? So just a couple quick thoughts and we can continue that dialogue. S Siri, look up human. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah. here we have. Thank you all for your in, uh, interventions. Um, the question's primarily for Professor Karotza, but generally as well. And that is, toward the end of your, um, your presentation, you um, said, well, the, the vitality of the movements also um, creates some uh, difficulties sometimes. Um, and so I wondered, the, the question is, um, how, what, what is the right relationship between the church hierarchy and, and those working for the church? Um, and, and I'm not going to use the word regulate, but uh, that gets towards the point, is how do we, how do we help um, by walking with the movements um, impel their work towards Catholic, full, full Catholicity, if I could say that, um, where, where creativity sort of it gets way out uh, in the field, as it were. Um, well, I, I, I referred, in, uh, you know, in, in my remarks already to the principles of, uh, of ecclesiality <coughs> that St. John Paul II had already articulated, and I think those are really, are really essential. The, the temptation of any human association, not just <laughs> the, the, the ecclesial movements, is to turn inward on themselves. Uh, and to regard themselves as having uniquely here uh, not just a charism given to them for the service of the church, but the charism by which one knows the truth. Right? Um, and the principles of ecclesiality he defines, now I don't have them written out here, but it'd be useful to go back to Christi Fidelis Leici, paragraph 30, where they are articulated, um, you know, are, I think are good guides to emphasize the way in which uh, the, the newness and dynamism and vitality of the movements needs to be connected to the church in its fullness always and, and open towards it to not turn inwards on themselves. So, you know, it, when, I, when I first began to get involved in community integration, it was very striking to me how much, even in all of this sort of ferment and activity and sense of new life, Father Giussani would always point to the Holy Father and always say, that's, that's <coughs> what we look at, that's what we follow, that's who we follow. We are in communion with him, always. He would always cite that one of the most important things in the history of the movement was the canonical recognition of, of the fraternity of CL and, the, and the, the, the words that the Holy Father addressed to us, as well as in every place that is present, the communion with the local bishop. Um, so, uh, and that didn't always sit well with the people who followed him. Um, you know, it, there, there, there was one, one example, and, and I just use this as illustrative of the kind of communion 
with the entirety of the church that's necessary, where one of the you know young, energetic, uh, sort of revolutionarily inclined uh, um, figures in, in in the movement um, uh, accompanied Father Giussani to visit one of the bishops in, in Italy of one of the, of the large cities, and um, and he he didn't want to kiss the bishop's ring when they got there, he didn't, you know, because this was this is clericalism and he was, was everything he was against. And, that's what movements are for, is to subvert all of this. Uh, but, <laughs> but, but, but Giussani did, and the bishop observed. He said, your, your, your friend here doesn't, you know, doesn't like us bishops, does he? And, and Giussani said, no, he doesn't, but by staying with me, he will. Right. So it was the recognition that by, by staying in communion, we're, we're educated to direct all of the, the life that the spirit generates in our companionship toward the good and the flourishing, the glory of the church in its entirety, and not just of ourselves or our, of our local group. Bishop Soto. You know, the question I had was of, of a similar nature and, and just, you know, and, and you've already alluded to that is the, um, you know, all the movements as, as they, most of them start out as, as kind of spontaneous movements and, and, and very informal, and then they, they essentially institutionalize themselves with, you know, within canon law and you know, a, a either a private or a public association of the faithful. And, and, and that that's a, an important um, evolution that takes place. And I guess I just would be interested of, of comments regarding that experience for each of the movements and, and how, that is, um, uh, how that's helped. Or uh, and maybe some of, um, you know, what um, um, the, the law is good, but maybe it's not always perfect. And, how, you know, what uh, are any shortcomings to that? And I'm uh, just interested in, in comments with, with regards to, uh, to that. Well, why don't I begin? Because I've got the longest uh, history to deal with, and there have been many, many, many changes over the centuries. Uh, there wasn't even a written code for the, for the order until uh, the... the 1130s, and uh, that was revised a couple of times, and then the, the Code Rohan was finalized in uh, about 1780, uh, just before the collapse of the order uh, because of the Napoleonic invasion of Malta. The, the order uh, as in spent the 19th century really recovering from the things that Professor Hittinger had mentioned, um, the end of the nobility, the industrial age, how do you reconfigure yourself? And uh, that was an important development that was done in conjunction with the Holy See, leading us to help get back to our basic charism of helping the poor and sick as our lords. Um, th and uh, that has continued to change even into uh, the, the 20th century, several different constitutional changes that were reflecting, for example, a lack of Knights of Justice, those who, who make three vows um, and are traditionally have been our leaders, but we haven't had adequate numbers. So the Vatican approved a second category called the Knights and Dames in Obedience, who can be, who are lay, but they do make a promise of obedience from which they cannot withdraw except with permission. Each of those things has been in conjunction with the Holy See to try to first of all, preserve that unity that's so important for us, but also to ensure that we stay in touch with the church and with our mission. I, I'll be very brief, but I can't resist answering this question because finally it's a question about law. It's something I know something about, <laughs> so, <laughs> as opposed to everything else, right? Um, and, and so I'll only say this much. Um, it's, um, we're, we're, we're all too accustomed to thinking of law as merely regulatory, and it's not. Law has really important functions that go beyond that. It's, it's constitutive of the way that we look at things. It's pedagogical. It educates us as to how to understand our role and the relationships that we have and our communities have with, with one another. So it teaches us when it's doing its job. So law is a, the juridical form of the movements, I think, is really essential to help educate us as to their relationship to the church as a whole in the same way that, you know, um, the, the presence of form in art, visual art or poetry, is an aid when, when, when it's done well 
to the beauty and the meaning of, of what the art is expressing in the same way. Here, the reality of these movements and these ecclesial realities are helped to be brought to light by giving it a juridical form that corresponds to the deeper meaning of, this, of, of the relationship. Here for you. Um, so I love this question, actually, because I'm reflecting on what I heard growing up as a kid participating in Focolari. And one thing that was really emphasized to us was both the spontaneity and the unity with the church. So Chiara um, Lubick, when, when the founder of this, of this movement, uh, had no intention of sort of launching a formal movement. So it was a very much a spontaneous act in 1943. Gradually, the, the Focolari spirituality and lifestyle spread to over 180 countries, came to the US in the early 60s, um, but did become sort of a formally approved ecclesial movement. So li always living and, and kind of evolving in unity with, with the church and in close collaboration um, with the Pope. So just as, as was mentioned earlier, that was the reality of folk art itself. Mm -hmm. John, for Father Boehner, one more comment here, sorry. Yes. If I can talk? Yes, please. <laughs> it's on. All right. Uh, just to say, many of these ecclesial movements actually existed before the church had such a category as ecclesial movement. <laughs> However, uh, if you look at them, uh, so going back to Mario and Giovanni back in 1867, young people, uh, and they're saying, uh, everyone is abandoning the church and abandoning Christ, but we're young and we love Christ and we love the church. What can we do? So it starts with that spontaneity. And within a year, they're there talking to Pius IX and getting ecclesiastical approval, whether they knew that's what they were going to do or not, but they got it and they moved it. Uh, Dorothy Day is feeding the poor, and they're calling themselves the Catholic Worker because they launched on May Day, 1933, when everybody was buying the Worker newspaper. And so she printed up a newspaper that was called the Catholic Worker. She thought it was just a newspaper. And suddenly all these people are gathering around her. People are in her house. She's feeding them. Her sister-in-law is helping her feed all these people. And the Archbishop of New York comes in and says, who gave you permission to call yourselves Catholic? And she says, well, we are Catholic. <laughs> and as he sits there with her and she's taking care of all these people, there's people who are really in, in desperate, we're in the middle of the Depression. He realizes this was the new embodiment of what it meant to be Catholic. And he said, I give you permission. <laughs> <laughs> After he leaves, she looks at her sister-in-law, Isabel, and she says, I didn't know we needed it. <laughs> but every single one of these groups, I want to say one more thing. Every single one of these groups started by young people. Even Father Giussani, who was already a priest, was not yet 30 when he was on a train ride and teenagers challenged him and said, put off the church. And he had to ask himself, having grown up in an environment of philosophy and theology, what are we really saying to young people? And so this is what pushed him, who had come through also Catholic action, saying we need new kinds of action, we need new kinds of responses. The young people spurred him, but he was still young. He was in his 20s, and he says, we've got to do this. We've got to do something. And, of course, he does it in, in league with his archbishop, who was Giovanni Battista Montini, hmm. now St. Paul VI. So there it is. So this is, this is all part of, of this, uh, this natural diet. And I think young people look to also the church in a way that's less skeptical or maybe less worried about, um, uh, you can say bureaucracy, but they look at it and say, how are we part of this and what can we do? And I think that's the response. Yeah, great. Thank you both. John. Wonderful panel, each of you individually, and really marvelous in combination, just th what the differences you're re remarking on. Paulo, last year, your Notre Dame colleague, Patrick Deneen, published a book, Why Liberalism Failed, the core thesis of which is that the extreme individualism in the culture was unwittingly created by the left and right in combination the left by elevating free lifestyles, and the right by free markets. And so all of you are uh, students of the history of movements. In light of the history that you studied, 
what insights can you share with respect to the current movements, success in making incursions against the deeply ingrained extreme in our culture today? Paulo. <laughs> you're the colleague, you, your brother's well, keeper. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, my, my colleague, and, and, uh, and, and frankly, I mean, a, a lot of my remarks about the pathologies of the age are not uninfluenced by my conversations with Patrick Deneen, um, who I, I respect and, and uh, think very highly of, including his work. Now, um, for all of its sort of Jeremiah against uh, li liberalism and modernity, Deneen himself gives an answer that, that is also positive at the end. It's not just a screed. Um, it is that, but it's not just that. Um, and uh, he himself is appealing to, to local forms of communal life as being the things that we need to, to try to revive and, and recapture. The, the one thing that I would add to that, though, is that um, it, it can't be done successfully just by an appeal to an ideology of localness. Uh, there has to be something that generates the community at its heart. Otherwise, it's nostalgia. Otherwise, we're thinking, like, we'd love to have community again and localness, but it's just an idea that I'm grasping for. There just needs to be something that generates it. So what generates it? Uh, it here, the, you know, the, we, we can name that from our experience. What generates it is an encounter. It changes the direction of your life. Right? And that's, I mean, that by itself, as Francis has said, quoting Benedict, quoting John Paul II, is really all that the movements are about at the end of the day. All the rest of it is, is, is consequence and, uh, and, and extra, really. Um, so I, I think the answer has to be there. Michael. I agree with that. I think also that it, that focus on the encounter with Christ helps keep us focused on having a single mission. And that single mission is at the core of what it means to have co-responsibility. We are all in this game together, and as, as soon as we start having separate micro objectives, then we risk getting apart. That's why uh, when you think about uh, the governance of the church, something like checks and balances, which I'm hearing more and more in response to uh, some of the, the, the scandal, is clearly the wrong approach. What makes us different is that we have a single mission, we are unified under the Holy See, but we're also co-responsible so that we all have an effort and we, uh, we have a responsibility to ensure the outcome as well as an a responsibility to do what our particular roles are based upon the talents that we've been given. Perhaps I could, well go ahead please. I was only going to add briefly, um, building on on what Paolo said that I think encounter has to happen time and time again, over and over again. And movements are, play a very large role in, in making that happen. And so for one's life to continuously unfold in an experience of real, authentic, generative community requires work and dedication and it's, it's not a one-off experience. And I can speak to that from my own life. And I've had moments in my own life where I feel like I've been much more distant from being a part of that generative community than other times. Um, and so I just would emphasize that I think encounter is, is right, that experience of mutual encounter, but that it has to happen again and again. I have a question right along that line. And one of the fundamental human needs which I don't think anyone truly transcends, it's perennial, is the solid transgenerational solidarity. Yeah. Now, in principle, political order is supposed to be transgenerational. I mean, what good would it be if it were only temporary, like the shutdown? I mean, you know, turn it on and off. Uh, ecclesial order in its broadest sense has always been thought of as transgenerational from birth and baptism all the way to the funeral. Um, with the movements, how do you and the movements understand the uh, role of the movement with regard to children and grandchildren? 
I mean, I'm assuming there's different answers to this. And uh, because based so firmly on encounter and uh, on intentionality, how do you view, uh, do you expect your children to be members of the movement? I'll leave it at that. Just briefly, the Order of Malta is, of course, very much based upon family. And it has had that noble tradition where you are part of, part of your parenting is to introduce the order to your children. Each of my children has gone with me, for example, on the Lord's Pilgrimage when they were 12 or 13 to, in order to have that experience of sharing. And the other thing, not so much uh, generationally, but or parents, but um, what we're seeing now is a tremendous amount of growth on university campuses for people who want to be auxiliary members of the order where there's a structure where they can cooperate in social works, social life, mm -hmm. prayer life together. And uh, I think that's partly, partly because, uh, partly a response to the lack of meaning, especially on college campuses these days. Mm -hmm. So the, um, the Focolare movement uh, has always had these unique expressions of vocation within, and to the earlier point about something being ecclesial rather than lay, there's been a really incredible mix of ordained, lay, um, young, old, married, single, um, individuals that have all found in some, some form of unique expression in terms of their vocation, sense of vocation and call to to, to a charism of unity. So Focolari has looked specifically at a vocation of what is called the gen or new generation, which is younger individuals within the movement, the vocation of a volunteer, which is non-ordained individuals engaged, the vocation of married and <coughs> single, what are called Focolarini, which are individuals who actually take formal vows and live in community. Um, what, what's been very interesting, I would say, in the last 10 years has been to see the evolution of looking at those vocations in the movement as somewhat siloed to being more integrated. So there are increasingly gatherings. We have something called the Mariopolis, City of Mary. It's a gathering that takes place annually in different communities around the world, and there's been an increasing, a growing intentionality around creating spaces where all of those vocations live together exist together, discern together, play music together, <laughs> you know, try to create these experiences of, um, of intergener intergenerational community and learning from the uniqueness of each vocation. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I, first I think it's worth observing that uh, overwhelmingly uh, the movements that, that, uh, that I mentioned and many others, many others beyond the ones that I mentioned have a concern for family and for education. Uh, amid everything else that they do, that's almost always a really central and important part. Um, secondly, uh, I'll say this about sort of my own relationship to my children. Um, uh, they, I mean, I, there, there comes a point um, that we all recognize as parents um, when our children's freedom becomes something that is so centrally compelling that you, you have to give them to something greater than yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, that you, that you, the recognition that a parent can't give them what they need in order for them to become aware of their own destiny. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the point at which, for my children, it's become absolutely critical that we've been able to give them over to a, an experience still within the church, but that is larger than just our family. And to me, the authenticity of, of what they've encountered there is, is, is confirmed in the fact that it doesn't necessarily lead them to stay in the movement that their parents were in. The real test, and this goes back to the question of the relationships of movements to the larger church, too. The real test is, does it lead them to find their vocations in the church? Good. Right? Mm -hmm. Not in CL, but as part of the body of Christ. And, and to the extent that, that that is the case, then I think that's the confirmation that we're doing it right. By the way, experiences of Catholics in this country whose primary ecclesial life is at the parish level, 
I think it's fair to say we don't have great expectations for next generation following in ecclesial life. What's, what's your guys' record? I mean, do you have better expectations of them going out into the full church and accepting ecclesial vocations? You're, you're doing a better job, I'm, I'm assuming, but I don't know. Um, uh, I think a lot of you know that I've spent half my life in Italy, and I'm a card-carrying member of Catholic Action, so there is a whole effort uh, to be there with young people, and they even have associations within that, as I saw, as I, many, I knew many of the other groups while I lived there. Um, the experience there is that the church is bigger than the parish, the church is bigger than the diocese, the church is truly universal. And so what can you do and how do you fit in? But the key that I saw in, in many of the movements that I saw in Catholic Action is centered on Jesus Christ. And so Jesus and us, and we're building, and we're building communion, and we're building church, and we're building it uh, brick at a time, person at a time. So, so I saw this, definitely this sense of the young is at the core of what they're doing, but then at the same time it is, how is, how is Jesus calling you? So this, this is, this, they're proactive in that, they're intentional in that, and, uh, and yeah, they're more successful that I see in terms of the movements of young people becoming, uh, really understanding that they are church. Mm -hmm. I would just say one, one very brief thing about this. I, I mean, this is as much, again, um, an observation of being a parent and a teacher uh, of young people. The, the fundamental problem that I see my, my kids and their peers facing is they don't understand why the church is interesting to their lives, right? I mean, re interesting to concretely to what they're living today. And the reason I think that many of the movements are more successful in helping to transmit the faith to that generation is precisely at that point. It's the point of, of demonstrating concretely and by, by the testimony of a human life lived, that faith actually matters to life, right? It really matters to everything that I'm living every day. And it's not just something that in a dualistic way can be abstracted from or separated from the experience of what I'm given to live today. One of the programs that the Order of Malta has is a high school uh, pilgrimage where we go chaperone a group of high school students to work in the Baths and Lourdes for a week. And it's one of the most transformational experiences that you can imagine, and I'm speaking only for myself, seeing them. These high school students are on fire, they want to learn more about their faith, and they get to see both the particular service of that person who needs help from whatever country that person might be coming from, but also to recognize the universality of the church because you've got people from 40 or 50 nations coming there. And we're working in the baths with people from many different countries. And our 17-year-olds are thrilled to help because most of the hospitalité are in there. They're retired, they're 70s, they're 80s. There are some heavy people who need to be helped and all that. And our 17-year-olds are really making a difference. Mm -hmm. One more question, Gil. I want to I want to go back Russ to your point which I think is immensely important transgenerational uh, sense of community uh, now I think it's three quarters of the heads of state of Europe have no children now they may be more compassionate more far-seeing than I am, but those of us who have children know that when you have children, you have skin in the game. You have a sense that your life, that the world that you have some influence over is part of their world, that you carry a responsibility. Now, we all learn about responsibility in an intellectual way. But I remember that m and my first child was still in the womb. Uh, I, I mean, I, I had to reconsider everything. And I think 
the dropping of the birth rates mm -hmm. and the individualism and the breakdown of transgenerational sense of community is immensely important. I just want to underscore that. Well, it, it is time for lunch. <laughs>